it's uh, Lou Mammo, and I, I I can't be sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, no, it's a little loud. It's yeah. a little loud. Is it, is it a little loud? Is it a little loud? Right. So here's the deal, friends. We are, uh, you know, we're playing around with a um, stream yard, and I don't know where the music is. The house band at stream yard is a little loud, but yeah. Yeah, that's right. House <laughs> babes is just a little. Uh, huh. And I do want to ask Chad, can you hear me? Hiding from Gravy. Yeah, hiding from the Gravy Squatch, says Nate. Right. Oh, we can't see the chat. Oh, no, no, it says David. It was David that said that. Oh, oh you can't see the chat. No, I can't see man. the chat. <laughs> <laughs> now the chat's um, going to be able to talk about it. Yeah, um, hold please um okay great thank you david david Bodie coming in with the with the win um how about we um do this oh gosh i found it i feel like this melody is pretty nice Ooh, hey there yeah, yeah there we are but there's a volume control Nice, it's a dance. Hello, guys. Hi. Hello. Now, um, on this day, I say unto you, uh, good moo ammo, mm -hmm. but I also say, I also say, oh, I know what. <laughs> I also say this. It's coming. I think. Holy smokes. Hopefully you're the one who knows. There it is. Breaking news. We have a scandal on our hands. Mm. The industry has been lying to you. Right? About what? What? They've been keeping dev secrets. So they've been lying to us or lying to them? Right. Uh, well, they've been lying to all of us, and you're here to set the record straight. Hey, the great Rafiki's here. Good to see you. Claude's here. Jonathan Jackson's here. Good to see you, friend. Uh, you Ooh. sound like a new name to me, and if that is the case, um, uh, let us know, and then we will um, get the uh, welcome paddle out. Um, let's see. Squire Cortez is here. <laughs> it says, happy Mumamo, good tidings, and gravy squatch drippings upon thee on this blessed day. Yeah, the welcome panel is just where we put the charcuterie board on. You'll be fine. Right. Absolutely it's, it's fine. Good. Absolutely fine. You rub your feet like first, and then the charcuterie board goes on top. Uh, and Dominic right. says, I meant, ooh. Um, indeed. Uh, Oranon's here. How's it going? Oh, gosh, we got official fancy news things. We do. Nice. Well, I mean, here's the deal. Um, we are talking about the art of building narrative story arcs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and we're going to explain it. Um, we're going to give you insider secrets, the things that TTRPG developers don't want you to know. But we're here to to tell you because we care. Well, we do want them to know. That's right. We do. Um, and, I mean, don't pay attention to the fact that the two of you have been hiding this secret for, I mean, a couple of decades at least, if not many, many decades. So um, we'll just gloss over that part. Oh, Warden Maximus says, happy Mumamo, everyone. Jim Jones says, howdy team. Look at everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you see what Oradon said? James Jones Jameson wants pictures of Spider-Man. We were just making that joke before we started. <laughs> I said, I said, but the show, right? So, yeah. So you're, perhaps you're vibing with us, Oradon. You are. And they always are. Everybody is. Uh, Ken Fams uh, here as well. And uh, SC Taren Maroon says, hello, everyone. Currently on break at work. Nice. Okay. Here's some breaking news. Also, basically, to me, a good story arc should consist of introduction introduce the, this is long this is lengthy introduce the heroes to mm -hmm. the situation and the villains some fight scenes some problem solving situations to keep the players on their toes mm -hmm. add in a plot twist if you really want to shake things up and final conclusion to wrap everything up uh, i think uh, we're done see it's like we didn't show everybody media. yeah you've done it friend good job um, everybody yeah, yeah no need us good work we've done it uh lucas haley says hi everyone Good to see you, Lucas. Warden Maximus, I'm only seeing the Twitch chats. No one else is coming through. Huh, okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, I see, so I can send a note to all destinations. 
but I don't think we have that thing that Restream did, which is the spin the other chats chat. to other. Yeah, so well, that's uh, that is a bummer. Um, perhaps I'm just, uh, you know, maybe it's a setting, and I'll, I'll dig into that. So uh, you may be missing some of your uh, compatriots at other places, um, but you'll always be in their heart. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, so gentlemen, um, we've got some news. Some mm -hmm. stuff to share that isn't about you know blowing the blowing the lid off this story. Chat pod is broken. Yeah, yeah. No chat on. Okay, Apu says no chat on the. Oh, that's right because you're not. <laughs> so sorry. Um, that was the one thing I forgot. Well, I can't actually. I so this Streamyard test is mm -hmm. uh, meant to sort of see do we like it better, and so far we do. But I only had three spaces to be able to broadcast to until we oh. buy the pro account. So that meant I had to make some choices. Um, but we'll get you back on, uh, Apook, I promise. And tell, give everyone my love and tell them to get over to YouTube and subscribe and like and do all that good stuff. Um, that's a, really a message for everybody. Take a minute, wherever you're at, make sure you're following us, liking us, give us the stars, give us the thumbs, whatever you got, give it to us. And um, <laughs> Apook's like, no, we do not like it better. Uh, I promise you'll be back in the fold. Um, but, uh, you know, tech limitations and such. Uh, Alex, you've learned some stuff today. I have learned some stuff today. <laughs> <laughs> About Gen Con. Hey, Sean Holland's here. Yes. yes. Oh, I was going to say, I went to the like... Museum of Play in Rochester <laughs> today. What things have I learned today? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us I went what to you the, uh, today. I went, to the, I went to the Museum of Play in Rochester today, and it was a ton of fun. Um. But uh, things I've learned specifically are that my Gen Con events have been approved for consideration, which means they have been approved to be considered to be approved by Gen Con. So they should be, they should be <laughs> good to go. Away. They're yeah, in they the pipeline. To go soon. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're being digested. So okay, well, have, that's good news. They have been approved for you to eventually learn if they are approved. Awesome. Yeah, they're basically waiting to do them all in a batch to figure out where I'm going to be once they set locations and times mm. and all that fun stuff. So. Uh, Chris Skinner asks, so is Facebook the wrong thing to watch from? No, not necessarily. No, you're fine. If you can hear us, you're in the right spot. If you can't, right. you're in the wrong spot. We like all the things. Yeah. Okay. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, Abel says, I like YouTube. I do too, Abel. Um, I do as well. Uh, so, uh, Nate, I do want to say, Nate Robbins, um, I want to um, share that uh, your, uh, I think it was a sort of a, a re, whatever they call it on Facebook when you sort of you know, do do sort of a, a stitch with the video that we sent out was quite funny. I thought that was very, very amusing. So good on you. And, um, you know, a little technical call out. Um, feel free to make some clips. Make some, you know, clip some stuff, whether you're on mm -hmm. Twitch or YouTube or Facebook. Uh, clip it up. We say funny stuff. Clip worthy things. Yeah. Yeah. Give yeah. yeah. a moment. Yeah. So let's get into it. Um, yeah. You know, put my face on have to. <laughs> That's right. Um, I I am worried, given the scandalous nature of this um, of this topic, if you two will be canceled. Gods, I hope so. <laughs> no way. I've been trying to get canceled to... for years. <laughs> Steve, wait, I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's like, I'm ready to be canceled. Um, so, Alex, let's start. Give us the shape of this discussion. Yeah, so we are talking today all about the art of building narrative story arcs for your mutants and masterminds campaign, which basically means how do you take this long string of adventures and turn them into one cohesive story? And how do you eat that elephant? Because that is a huge task. Um, you can mm. be looking at telling a story that lasts six weeks, six months, six years. It's just however many adventures you have. adventures? Yeah, could be 58 adventures if you're silly like me. <laughs> um, basically, taking the big macro picture and figuring out where the individual pieces of that story come together. Mm -hmm. uh, starting with your beginning, your end, and then all of the different plots in between, and then some of the subplots that get put underneath the big overarching plot. It can seem like a lot. Yeah. Um, but we're here to help you make it not so much. All right, I like it. Now, there's some interesting questions. I, I do have to say this as well. Uh, John, uh, this was your topic. This is what you suggested during our planning mm -hmm. episode. And so to unto you goes a, a, you'll have to imagine it in your mind's eye, a, a hero point. 
tools that you mm -hmm. can use in real life. Um, uh, so yeah, let's, uh, wait for it to come in the mail. And um, if you don't get it in three or four weeks, uh, give me a call. We should start uh, yeah. real life hero points out and around, but right? I really want to. I really want to. Oh, I do. I do. Yeah, super fun. Um, even on that card, you know, I think we could we could have some fun with that. Mm -hmm. um, so here's there is a question. So um, I don't know what this means. So I look forward to the explanation. What are your opinions on starting an adventure in media res? Mm -hmm. Big fan. It, it means literally in the middle of things. It's a oh. cinematic technique for basically starting a scene literally in the middle of the action. So for example, in the midst of a fight or a chase or a big explosion or oh, something fun. like that, that just throws things immediately right into the action. I'm a big fun, fan of that. Like Alex yeah. says. I'm a big fan of it for one shots in particular um, because it also serves as a backdoor tutorial for how combat works in Eminem. For mm -hmm. a brief, if you do like a one round combat encounter at the beginning of the scene, yeah. and then either that gets resolved and the adventure really begins, or the consequences of that fight are the inciting point for the rest of the adventure that's going to get told. Oh, I like um, that. I like that. I do a, um, I have a Justice League adventure that I run called Justice League Fire Lizards and Forgotten Lairs that begins with the Justice League fighting the Legion of Doom. And after one round of combat, one of the Justice Leaguers gets punched into an apartment building where Mixie and the fifth dimensional imps are playing D&D. &D. And he's like, hey, you ruined my game. And they all get transferred into his D&D &D game. And that's where the real adventure begins. Mm. Mm, nice, nice. Uh, so um, Angel Arroyo says, or asks, would an overarching organization or villain be a puppet master of the small scale villains or disasters be such a part of storytelling? Can be. Or would, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in your story arc, you may have a behind the scenes villain who is manipulating things that the heroes may not original, initially be aware of. Um, and part of your planning, your story arc, is getting a sense of when that reveal is coming in terms of that villain's involvement and that they're behind it all, essentially. Um, so that would definitely be part of your story arc planning. Yeah, if, um, if you're just getting started, I think it's easier to have one central antagonist for your, your campaign. Um, they don't have to be in every adventure, but they're sort of a unifying force and a cohesive mm -hmm. point to help or to help keep your adventure planning streamlined. Right. Um, you have a backup default, like this is the villain for any certain adventure within the larger story campaign. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ken Fam asks, uh, how much information should you give players at session zero to help properly build a character arc around their backstory? I am a big fan of giving a lot of information in session zero and incorporating a lot of the players requests during session zero. So mm -hmm. generally when I make a session zero document, it's like five to 10 pages of um, the first page is just like the big, big picture. This is what the campaign's about, but then I'll go into what locations, what villains, what themes, whatever I want to deal with, and then leave space and questions in those low, low, smaller sections to ask players as we're going along. And when they're coming up with their backstory, I encourage them, all right, so you say you work for this company. What is this company? What are they like? Who is in charge? That's your part of the world to world build. Sort of right. Deal. Right. And one thing you can work with with the players in session zero is the notion of casting certain roles in the story arc, um, if there is going to be a prominent role in the story arc for a character who is a scientist, for example, you can say, you know, one of the roles in this story arc is the scientist character. And is anybody interested in playing that character? Um, and if so, what is your, you know, vision of that? And then hopefully you can, uh, you can adapt your, your story arc around the player's feedback from that and sort of a give and take. If they say, you know, my scientist character is going to be, you know, like a real like inventor type, you know, then you can you can build that into role abilities in the story arc. Um, mm -hmm. And that way you sort of elements of the characters' backgrounds. So the story arc is tailored to them specifically. 
Yeah, I like to think that session zero is step two in a bigger organizing phase for when you're coming up with your story arc. And step one is almost coming up with like a Mad Lib style outline where you Mm -hmm. leave blanks, you leave spaces, and this is the kind of character I want to be involved in here. And you present that Mad Libs to your players and they fill in. I want my character to be this or I want an NPC in my life to be this. And that's sort of the big discussion during session zero. Right. A um, couple comments. Uh, Dominic says, um, let's see, uh, says quite a bit, which is great. And it's all good stuff. Big fan of villains who are doing, um, who are good at doing Xanatos gambits. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what that uh, is. That so just like, it's a gargoyles reference. Mm-hmm. Ah, I see. Okay. David, so David Xanatos was one of the master villains on gargoyles. Yeah. Someone text oh, crystal. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, because that can be a big struggle with big picture schemer villains and uh, they often get stuck in the background and only yep. show up at the end, meaning the heroes don't get as much one-on-one interaction with the end boss. And Claude says, I have to go villain of the week. And then mm-hmm. when a bigger mm-hmm. threat comes up, some of those can reoccur. <clears throat> in minions I, had, of that I have a tendency to follow um, the model of starting with sort of villain slash challenge of the week early on in the story arc as a way to do small self-contained stories so the players can get their feet wet and get us, you know, get a sense of what their characters are like and get a feel for the game and things can start to gel a little bit Mm -hmm. before you start getting into the more connected, deeper elements of the plot. Um, Mm -hmm. So if your story arc is one that can feature what seems to be at least initially some unconnected things, that's a good way to start um, because then mm-hmm. you can later on get into, oh, hey, those things actually are connected. And here it turns mm-hmm. out is why. And now you're starting to dig a little deeper into that uh, as far as that goes and getting into more of the, oh, like the you know master villain is behind many of these things. And- mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes I'll use those early adventures as almost like an audition for who the main villain is going to be. Yeah, um, as like this is what the players are actually interested in pursuing, or this is what's captured their imagination the most. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's a really good point too. One of the things I do for my design is just old-fashioned index cards, where I have different discrete parts of the arc written out, and I will often sort of reshuffle those as play proceeds. And I'm like, oh, this part actually needs to come earlier. And this part Mm -hmm. needs to happen later. Um, And I like to have a lot of sort of dangling threads to start with. And Mm -hmm. as things progress, start to sort of weave those in to the the campaign, Uh, depending on which ones look like they're the most interesting. And like like Mm -hmm. Alex says, the things that appeal to the players the most. I dig it. I dig it. Make the players do more work. Hey, I want to real quick uh, say um, hi to Kathy Evans, who's hanging out. Now, I'm going to try something. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, um, but let's see where this Hold on, everybody. Hold on. Hold on to your keyboards. Hey, that works. Okay. Okay. So there we go. All right. Um, So I can pull those up and people can see those questions. I like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like that it's right over your face as as it is, but, uh, Mm. you know, what can we do? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, I'm sorry. Did you want to read that? No, no, no. I was, I was being the neighbor from. I I see. From the next door. Yeah. Yeah. Right over the fence guy. Um, so the villain is still thwarted and then, yes, exactly. Um, Dominic sounds like the light from young justice. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, awesome stuff. Um, and there's lots of ways you can backfill importance to those early adventures if you need to, um, if you mm-hmm. need to connect them to the wider plot, you can come up with some reason that they're connected that wasn't immediately yes. obvious in the beginning. Yeah, and you do have to be flexible in terms of your planning. And sometimes mm-hmm. it is a, a, a game of turning a, a twist in the adventure campaign into, well, that's really what the villain wanted all along. And you know, you've just played into mm-hmm. their plan uh, so far as that goes. Let's no, see. Yep. Se- uh, Hanover Fist says, in session yep. zero, I like to give players a questionnaire that has questions like, what do you want to accomplish? Things you'd rather not do. Yeah, mm-hmm. anyone to interact with? I'd, I yep. appreciate that. You know, as somebody who is, um, I've been playing TTRPGs for some time, but, you know, once you kind of crack 
the code, you want to get a little deeper in your role play. You want to get mm -hmm. a little, you know, and, and be a little more, it, it can be difficult to kind of find that beat. And I think the GM plays a great role in sort of facilitating that. That sort um, of questionnaire is both good for sort of drawing lines that the players, you know, are like areas where they're, that are just no goes for players, mm -hmm. things they don't want to see or don't want to deal with in the context of the campaign. That's great information to have. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also fine tune those kinds of questionnaires for the kind of story arc you're running. If you know, for example, that the character's greatest fears are going to be feature in an upcoming adventure in your story arc, you can ask them in the session zero questionnaire. So what's your character's greatest fear? You know, uh, what is the thing that would most tempt your character if, you know, you know they're going to be encountering, uh, you know, a tempter villain like Mr. Infamy or Hades, uh, you know, um, things like that. Uh, you can you can sort of prepare yourself for the story arc by asking the players really targeted questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, you know, I want to say... Like in the control. Am I roboting or are you? You lost for a second, Alex. Yes, yeah, oh, you lost for a second. Time. Yeah. Am I real again? You're back. Okay. Yep, you're real. Um, I said, um, what kind of people are is your character attracted to? So I can have them show up and be villains. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, hey, uh, let's take a quick break on the narrative uh, story arc discussion, mm -hmm. and let's uh, let's go to uh, to Patreon land. Sure. There's some news, yes. right? Um, we have breaking we have, news from Patreon. We do. Where's the music? Uh, <laughs> where's, the, where's the news button, Troy? Ready. I wasn't ready. Um, but yeah, so there is. All <laughs> right, there there is um, uh, news, and it's uh, breaking, and it's really we have to fix it. Very, ooh, yeah, it's yeah, it's me. very broken. Um, let's do it this way. Um, where is the news? How about this? Tonight in Patreon news. To you yes. now to you, Steve Kenson. <laughs> well, I, 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 I understand we have finalists in our first Mad Libs and Masterminds uh, uh, polls. Yep, the uh, our heroes in Patreon have lovingly gifted me uh, Atlantis as a location. <laughs> And Gamma the Atom Smasher as the villain for the uh, the star and location mm. you know, of our first Mad Libs and Masterminds. So I'm trying to remember. I'm going to work on that. Believe it or not, I, that's a very I good question. This. Right. I do love this, and uh, I, I want to say so. The, for those of you who aren't on the Patreon, basically, uh, Alex kind of started a new fun um, a challenge, if you will. Uh, it's sort of like. Vote on a place and vote on a villain, and and Alex is going to create something out of that. And um, <laughs> Claude says was not expecting Gamma. <laughs> yep. See, it's the magic of ranked choice voting. That really, yeah, ranked choice voting works. We believe in it. We use it um, uh, to great effect. It's going to be a ton of fun figuring out what he's doing in Atlantis and why. But uh, you're going to get an adventure <laughs> outline from me. Um, and yeah, we'll see. I'm aiming to have that to you by Friday. Nice, nice, nice. Um, Moo Memo, Jump Scare Edition. Is that music too loud? <laughs> I'm not sure. We, I'm we're still you fine really tuning the, the, the music. On, we on are, you know arts. us. Um, let's see. Abel was saying, uh, I was hoping for um, Megalodon if it became Atlantis. Yeah. Well, we could always put Megalodon in another poll next time, mm -hmm. but. We're trying to come up with some new characters for the new polls as well. That's true. Yeah. yeah we'll and definitely so have like a Megalodon. loser's round eventually. I, I figure... Megalodon't, more right. like. <laughs> Megalodon. I, I figure the high vote getters, you know, like the second and third place ones are mm -hmm. worth, you know, putting back in the poll. You oh, know, that's a good idea. Point, you know. So yeah. you keep, it, keep the, the, runner, the runners keep, up keep, and then keep everybody else. A chance. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, oh, Claude, look at him unionizing. Everyone rally together to push for a villain team up as our next Mad Libs and Masterminds. Well, as it happens, the next poll actually does involve villain teams. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, look at so, that. Ask, and we have already thought so, about it. Uh, so that's, uh, 
the villain villain turn map would probably be a lot for one party of MM characters. Oh, I don't know. I think we could do an interesting um, poll with two villains. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Two, yeah. separate, two separate villain polls, and the top two villains will team up. That is right. So, you know, it's like, like you would do a president, vice president or something, you know, um, I like it. I like it. Um, uh, Ken Pham says a sea based enemy in Atlantis would be too easy. Yeah, it would be. Right. Well, what is he made of? He's what made is of atoms. What is well, you know, it's pretty awesome. made of atoms. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I was going to say like that. That seems like a wonderful power. I, too, have that power, I think. Right? It's, like, it's, it's like the joke. What do you know about atoms? Very little. What, what else? <laughs> I get it. They're small, everybody. Uh, Oranon, says Gamma, Oranon says, Gamma's on vacation. Mm -hmm. What am I to show it? Right. Gamma's on vacation. Have him show up oh, and swim true, trunks. Oh, true. The beach episode. Snorkel. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. He's got a cousin who's... Uh, well, you know, I, moved to the... I don't think we should write Alex's adventure for him, but, you know, I do think it's interesting to note that, you know, large masses of water are really effective radiation shielding. Mm-hmm. Very well, true. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're like, I will take note of that. Um, <laughs> hey, um, is he the, the central antagonist, or is he the victim in all this? <laughs> Well, that's mm, kind I of like up to you, isn't it? Yeah, well, they wanted like him to be the villain, so I, I feel like I should make him the villain. But but ultimately, aren't you the villain? That's true. It's so true. Yeah, My players yeah, agree. <laughs> Tim says, that's right, the ones that are still around. Um, right. Tim says, uh, how will Valiant Comics fit into the Mutants and Mastermind system? Will there be any differences from how it usually plays? Perhaps new superpowers? A little off the beaten path, but he was well, very insistent. Um, Valiant, uh, the Valiant Adventures role playing game is intended to be fully compatible with Mutants and Masterminds third edition. However, we are presenting some new rule changes to reflect the setting of Valiant, um, particularly in regards to how lethal it is, how it's traditionally lower power level than a lot of other traditional superhero settings. Mm -hmm. um, and we are looking to do some consolidating in terms of powers, uh, particularly with the affliction power. Yeah. Nice. Let's see here real quick. Um, Nate says, so I sat down after 10 years, not really talking to a friend of mine. We spent three hours catching up on the narrative of AD and D campaign from 35 years ago. Okay, great. We'll keep us posted on your social calendar and we will announce it to everyone here on the stream. So speaking mm -hmm. of Alex as the villain, we should talk mm -hmm. about we should talk about the role of traumatizing your heroes as part of your mm -hmm. story arc. Alex, is special. let's do it. Mm -hmm. That is traumatize great. them often and right varying degrees. <laughs> you can't be on eleven all the time, or they'll get numb to it. You got to do lower doses, mm -hmm. lower doses. I Fight, see. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do, okay. you, how do you how do you plan out all the bad things that are going to happen to the heroes? Yeah, what's your pattern matching? How do you do that? Um, I generally look at the backstory information that the players have provided me for their characters, and I look for points of transition or points of irritation or points of pain, things that can be things that they have indicated in their text that they want to be something that is to be explored. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, and I, and I ask them, you know, what are you comfortable with? Is this are you looking to just escape? You don't want any of this like extra smoke because a lot of the other players do want the extra smoke, but some people don't. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of paying attention to what they present initially and then coming up with new and exciting ways for it to be bad. Um, particularly any instance where there's, a, there's an NPC that they've been leaning on who can either die or turn against them. Um, but you don't want to overdo it because eventually they stop trusting anybody you put in front of them. Mm. And it's very right. much, it's very much trial and error. It's you, you play a campaign, you, you sort of navigate that morass a little bit and you learn when it's too much and when it's not enough. And mm -hmm. I am a big fan of palate cleansing episodes at, after, uh, traumatizing ones also. Right. You need a little yeah. light hearted something after a really mm -hmm. big dramatic episode yeah there was an episode of nether war where steve was gracious enough to come on without enough preparation um 
and he was playing the role of Adrian Eldridge. And at the end of that adventure, Adrian Eldridge heroically sacrificed himself to get the rest of the heroes out of the situation they were in. And they were betrayed by Bowman's girlfriend. And that was a whole situation. And then afterwards, we went to the idiot box for a little while to chill out. Mm -hmm. Nice. Because the fun TV episode was a lot of fun. And that, okay, so that really points out the the related notion of, in addition to the just sort of main story arc, there are all of these character arcs where mm -hmm. each character has their own story, their own subplot, their own progression as a character. Um, and it's about, you know, whatever story their player wants to focus on, whether it's confronting their old mistakes or overcoming their personal foibles or achieving some long held goal or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever, you know, character goals they, they decide, you know, are important to their character and how their character grows over the, the course of the story. Yeah. That's another session yeah, zero thing I like to do, which is ask each player, what kind of character arc do you want to go on? And is, does anybody volunteer to have the sad one <laughs> or, Sure. Right. Yeah. Who who's in the mood? Who can carry this? You know. Uh, yeah. And you you, you have to be mindful. You have to be empathetic, and you have to communicate and check the vibe and everything. Everyone's trying um, to figure out how to min max your power of uh, trauma distribution. <laughs> they, so Alex, they should, you know, I have, they should know oh, your like, power level X by now, but. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Alex, I do have a couple questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. There, there's an art form and I've seen you do it because I've, I've played in games and I've watched you run games that I've played in games that you've run and watch you run games. You have a way of sort of ebbing a, an ebb and a flow. And I, I, sometimes I can, you know, see the wheels turning, like you're kind of like, okay, what are, what am I going to do? This person just grabbed the villain's weapon and killed him with it. You know, like, how do I, but uh, also I, I'd imagine even with the, with traumatic moments as well, um, mm -hmm. you seem to have a kind of almost like a sixth sense. You go, you go to a place and you take it to that, to that edge and then you bring it back so that it's not, it's not like you're leaving people permanently traumatized but it, it's challenging to the degree that that person can take it or wants to you know what i mean uh, how how yeah. do you how do you develop that skill how how is that is that a thing you're born with or i wouldn't say i'm born with it <laughs> um i would say that i have the strange luck of being a game master since i was 11 years old so i've spent a lot of time observing people reacting to gameplay and getting to sort of do that rain man dance with them yeah. Um, but it's you one of the most important GM skills that you can develop is empathy um, mm. and being able to sort of put your to feel how the players are engaging with the material and always remembering that the goal is to traumatize the character, but not the player. And right. the GM's job is not to win the game. It is to make an interesting and challenging story, and it's an, it's sort of an instinct that you you practice and you practice and you practice, and eventually mm -hmm. you get you get you get good at it. It's just I'm trying to think if there's any like tricks to get started with, and yeah, I mean, or, or even a mindset to put yourself in an empathy honestly, sort of space. Honestly, I think that the thing that has served me well as a game master is asking myself the question. The cool thing to happen now would be, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily the thing that would be the most difficult uh, mm -hmm. or the biggest setback, although sometimes that is the answer. Um, mm -hmm. But the but the coolest thing to happen right now would be what? Um, yeah. And sometimes yeah. that departs from my planned story because a cooler mm -hmm. thing presents itself. And I'm right. like, oh, but it would be really cool if this happened right now. Um, and sometimes you just have to, when that opportunity presents itself, you just have to go with it and see what yeah. happens. It's very much being willing to follow the cool, follow the story beat and being willing to throw everything away. If you have to, to rewrite based on the cool thing that happened just now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it does remind me a little bit. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, and consuming a lot of stories. I think consuming mm -hmm. a lot of stories in the media that you're engaging with is another great way to uh. get a sense of how these stories move, 
think and don't just observe them casually write down where's the beginning of the story where does it transition to the next part of the story why did this happen to that character and really mm -hmm. analyzing um and getting story yeah. into your getting story into your bones that's really that will serve you very well as a gm you know it strikes me that this sort of extemporaneous action or the stuff that you're doing is is really in line with just what improv is like it's it's mm -hmm. giving yeah and if everybody's on stage giving to each other you know and, and sort of the yes ending um, mm -hmm. th that just creates just a kind of this sort of virtuous cycle um that's that's interesting so Ornon brings up a great question and it's one thing that i actually have always wondered how you do this but uh the idea that so it's you know your character arc after the original character arc uh, mm -hmm. like season two of your, even of your character or your TTRPG, how do you prepare for that? Or how do you, like, is it about a palate cleanse and sort of some low vibrational sort of trauma with some spikes or like, how, how do you do that? It can be, um, it mm -hmm. can be, you can grow a new story arc out of what happened as a resolution to the previous one. Um, especially right. if they get something that they thought they always wanted and it's not quite what they thought it, it was. turns out it's not yeah <sighs> yeah that's a great place to build to your next story arc um, exactly or having them react to the consequences of something that happened as a result of what happened in the last season right and just like alex says you know watch or consume media you know like that you know watch you know a series that has multiple successful seasons and look mm -hmm. at the different character arcs that characters have over the course of that series, you know, sometimes it will be, you know, very different, you know, where it will be, you know, in season one, it is all about the character coming to terms with, you know, their powers or their new role. Um, and then they're more comfortable in that by the end of season one. And then mm -hmm. season two is, is about, you know, now that they have accepted that role, you know, how are they going to, you know, accomplish it? You know, what is their what is their plan moving forward, you know, for example, you know, but there are all kinds of different, you know, changes in character direction and character arc. Yeah, another great thing to ask your players when they're first setting out for character creation is what incorrect thing does your character believe about themselves or the world and trying mm. to have them come up oh, with a couple good. of those options. Yeah, um, because those are great areas of growth. Those are great places to start when you're looking for a character arc. Yeah, and absolutely. that belief can be like, I believe I'm worthless, or I believe that I will never be good enough for this, or it can be that I believe that somebody is responsible for all the problems in my world, in my life. Right, right. You know, Claude says, I watched a really good podcast recently that had a character that needed to figure himself out mm -hmm. after achieving the revenge he had sought mm -hmm. previously. Sure. Yeah, so, so often that feels like uh, almost like a, um, you know, sort of a... Uh, like a suicide mission you know like i'm yeah. just going to like i'm blown up my life i don't have you know my my partner's gone my job is done because i've been on this vigilante rampage um right. that's very interesting yeah yeah um, well that's a great example of what alex was talking about of when you finally get this thing that you wanted and you've been completely focused on and then realize it isn't as fulfilling as you would hoped it, had, it mm -hmm. would be then what uh, Jones, you bring up something really interesting here. I just want to pop this up real fast. And that is that, you know, your session zeros don't mm -hmm. have to be the first session. I mean, they can be the first okay. and then, you know, whenever you need to have that moment, read well, the room. Should, and You should be checking in with your yes. players and course correcting, you know, based on their feedback and getting yeah. a, just, just getting a sense of, you know, are, you know, your character's goals moving in the right direction? Are you enjoying the adventures? Or the things you're not enjoying, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, GM Jonesy, we are calling it uh, Sesh Z now. That's how we're referring to that. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Sesh, that Z. Yeah. Sesh Z. Sesh um, Z. Let's see here, real quick. Um, okay, here's a good question from Ken. Uh, let's see. How do you deal with a character death midway through an arc? It's mm -hmm. easy at the beginning it, it, or at the end, but in the middle, that's a tough one. Yeah, character death is very hard, um, and it's very difficult in a superhero genre um, because death is so impermanent in the superhero right. genre. And I've always been a firm proponent that character death is something that should be dramatic, agreed mm -hmm. upon, and appropriate for the story. Yep. Um, 
I think if it happens in the middle, I think you should never let it come down to dice rolls. Um, if a villain defeats a hero, mm-hmm. um, don't have them kill them, have them capture them or mm-hmm. embarrass them. Or yep. um, I had a in our Nether War game, Bowman went off to go fight two speedsters by himself, and he was incapacitated. But instead of having the two speedsters kill him, they just they took his bow and they mm-hmm. used him for target practice. They'd shoot arrows and run after the arrows and catch him with them. And then they deposited him at the f- steps of Freedom Hall and said, next time send a real superhero to fight us. I that see. Was a, that's that was a, a horrible moment for Bowman. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, a, what a character motivation, you mm-hmm. know, for both Bowman and the other heroes. Absolutely. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, and something that is, you know, a weight that is a burden that is a lot heavier than, you know, death. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I do like this. I think it's an important piece of the Mm -hmm. when we talk about kind of lean into the fun of this and you know i I could imagine a situation where uh maybe a player is is wanting to play an arc where the you know and maybe coming in with a new character or uh, you know a a child or you know go ahead i will say that that is the one exception that i would make to alex's guideline is if mm-hmm. a player wants to sacrifice their character and has wants to, to go out in the blaze of glory or have their character mm-hmm. like sacrifice themselves in order to achieve a goal, then they should absolutely get the most dramatic death scene that you can mm-hmm. you can give them as far yeah. as that goes. That's what absolutely. I include agree upon as one of the guidelines. Right. Is. Absolutely. Yeah, and even in that moment, uh, how many heroes have had a final, final, real, real death? Sure. I mean, that's you know, comics yeah. for you, you know. That's right. And as R.C. says, Mutant Heaven yes. is a revolving door. Revolving door, revolving door. Yeah. That's right. And I yeah, would, I would right. encourage you, if a player is looking for that, to bring them into the planning on their death and yeah. working behind the scenes with them to sort of navigate how that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, right. ideally. ideally. Yeah. And potentially prime the other players because for some reason, if the other players don't know, they will do everything possible to prevent that death. That is the one problem with that. I, in my experience, this is exactly that. When you when you know there's a dramatic death scene, the sometimes the other players will just not, they will fight you on it. They just mm-hmm. will not let it happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, interesting. So RC says, um, we've got to hope that Bowman never takes off his ankle weights for all. <laughs> For all our sides, um, or all our sakes, rather. And, you know, what's interesting about that is, I, you know, I, Bowman seems like more of a shake weights kind of guy. But um, sure. I mean, you know, I that's learned something new. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Mastermind Apook says, like Alex said, if there's going to be a death, it's because the GM and the player discussed it and agreed. Mm-hmm. And it was the best mm-hmm. thing for the story and everyone's experience. Absolutely. That's yep. true. I agree. Um, yeah. And, you know, a Pook over the Freedom Oh, go ahead, Trent. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, you know, Pook over in the Freedom Verse, you know, uh, death is never assumed even when mm-hmm. incapacitated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Super. And then in a superhero role playing game, death is, it can be a little more casual than in a fantasy RPG. Like it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, consequences of your actions as a superhero are less about your personal harm and more about what you couldn't protect or mm-hmm. what the villain gets away with rather than a consequence right. of your foolhardiness. Yeah, you know, and, and let's let's uh, pivot here. I think Joe brings up something interesting, an interesting aspect or something you can kind of in- incorporate into your story arc. But then there are those villains who break the fourth wall while you were writing and it just just to mess with your story. Um, mm-hmm. Talk to me about like when you're creating this story arc, how, how much how deeply do you get uh, like do you get to a point where you're sort of communicating in a way sort of like what would this villain do and how would they act in this moment? And you know, uh, when it comes to like branching story and all of that, like how, mm-hmm. how much do you get into that? Mm-hmm. When I'm creating, to... oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, when yeah. I create a villain, um, I am, especially in regards to a long form story arc, I'm less concerned about what their exact plan is and more what their motivation is, what they want to pay to accomplish the goal and what they're willing to sacrifice if that price isn't met. Um, so that the villain, I always know what the villain wants and what they're willing to give up if to accomplish mm-hmm. that goal. Ah, uh, right. interesting. Those are the key that things. A, that's very interesting. Just the notion that you've got in your mind sort of the the trigger for, you know, like how far will they, how, how much will mm-hmm. they sacrifice? Um, yeah. Very fascinating. Right. Yeah. Because right. there's and, a price they want to pay for it. 
and then there's like, a price that they're willing they're to pay. They're willing to pay, yeah. Mm, and one might be not quite as, as heavy as the other. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, indeed. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Did you want to add some thoughts, sir? I, I agree with Alex in that regard. I mean, I think that keeping the, the villain's goals in mind are the key things uh, so that you can adjust them based on what happens in the arc. And if, you know, the initial plan doesn't work out, you know, what is their sort of backup plan or, you know, mm -hmm. what is there another way they're going to go about achieving their goal uh, as far as that goes? Because the in a superhero story, the villain is really the, the primary motivating force. Mm -hmm. um, heroes are generally reacting to the villain's plans in some way uh, or the villain's actions. The villain initiates the adventure because mm -hmm. they start doing something and the heroes are going to stop it. Um, so knowing, uh, having a really good solid sense of what the villain is motivated to do is really the key thing to keep mm -hmm. things moving. Absolutely. Yeah, you if you do get into, um, oh, uh, I was just going to say, Troy, if you do get into the minutia of the villain's plan, I think that's a great place to start looking for story arcs, especially if the villain has plans yes. to acquire things. You can build an arc around mm -hmm. each of those Yes. things that they're trying to accomplish and you know and and being clues to the motivation and mm -hmm. that's a piece of the puzzle that the you know that the heroes have to kind of unpack right, right. and One if you're the... looking for a way to increase player agency within the villain's plan you can find a way for them to acquire what the villain's plan is and then they can plan if they're going to keep reacting to what the villain is doing or try to jump ahead of them in the plan mm -hmm. right oh, i like that right yeah one of the key questions to ask yourself in planning out a story arc is what is the hero's entry point? Basically, when, when and how do they find out what's going on? Um, because the obviously the perfect villainous plan is one that the heroes never find out about it until it's too late. That's um, right. You know, and honestly, that can even be an interesting way to start a story arc. Um, is with that sort of scenario, and what happens if um, you know the villain just is so effective? that they, they succeed and the heroes mm -hmm. are, instead of looking at stopping them, they have to be looking at how are they going to undo what the villain mm -hmm. has, has accomplished. That's you almost know, like I, starting I, your campaign in media res. Yeah, indeed. You know, an interesting uh, uh, notion in, uh, I feel like a lot of what the GM does is prepare and sort of played up context mm -hmm. and, and sort of putting you in, uh, in that space one way or the other and you know yeah, ken brings absolutely. up a very interesting um uh concept and what is a question really how do you feel about using an off-screen camera like showing what the villain is doing without the heroes actually being there i have done that um for players mm -hmm. on occasion where i've done cut scenes that are basically intended for the audience and not the mm -hmm. heroes uh, because it provides a useful context for mm -hmm. the story um it's harder when you're limited solely to the point of view of the heroes um, because you can't provide that added context. Um, mm -hmm. it, it can even be fun uh, if the players are into the notion to um, play out scenes where they play the roles of some of the villains or NPCs having a scene that doesn't involve the heroes, mm -hmm. you know, off stage, as it were, um, that gives them added context. If, if your players are good at compartmentalizing what they know um, and uh, can separate what they as the player know from the, what their characters know, uh, it can be a really interesting technique to give mm -hmm. the players uh, additional points of view. I also think it's a really good technique to help establish a rapport between the villain and the heroes if the heroes don't have a lot of scenes where they actually interact with them in character or the, the players mm -hmm. in the villain rather than the characters yeah. in the villain um, so that they can get a reason to have like a personal, I hate this guy uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that's one of the I main like appeals to a central antagonist is that they can have this personal, Oh my God, I have to stop you feeling with that character. Right. Oh, Claude brings up an interesting point as well. It does have a very comic book. Feel. It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I like that. Um, so here is uh, a John asks a question. What was uh, so? What were the two most difficult adventures to link together in an arc for the upcoming adventures assembled? Into the Idiot Box was my hardest one for any. Oh, really? Adventure. Like how just finding just finding an excuse to go to TV Land for a brief sojourn. Um, hmm. 
uh, I had to I had to really do some mental gymnastics to get us there without a cork showing up to start the problem. Yeah. Um, because Cerebus okay. Rex was the main villain in my story. So right. he doesn't want to go to the idiot box. He doesn't even know what TV is. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, like, I yeah. love it. Yeah, the other ones um, fit together pretty well in my mind. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the hardest one to fit into that story arc was. Um, but I'm not honestly sure. I found Into the Idiot Box fairly easy because it's such a, um, you know, deus ex machina to begin mm -hmm. with. Um, but um, I remember that, um, um, actually, I think my own Green Thumb Black Heart might have been hardest to mm -hmm. work into that particular arc that I came up with. I like it. Um, and that's, I mean, and I think that's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say like this whole entire conversation has been amazing. Um, I mean, clearly we have well and truly blown the lid off mm -hmm. of this discussion. We have exposed Indeed. those secrets and, um, and we're awesome. Um, what do you think, Nate? Oh, the good. Okay, the world great. will never be the same. <laughs> Nate agrees. That's wonderful. I love it. There's so many good campaigns happening out there in the world. Right. And, right. And John has rightly pointed out for folks who want to get a look at this in practice, the the way that um, Alex and Crystal and I took the all the adventures and astonishing adventures assembled and mm -hmm. built three completely different story arcs uh, out of them um, is a great uh, way of uh, learning how you can uh, basically fit things into a particular story arc just mm -hmm. by reshuffling the events and looking at them in a particular way yeah absolutely yeah. um oh kathy Evans i think is another so thing to, for some reason. Oh, i think another oh, thing ahead. to really consider um is how long your campaign is going to be yes. because you can generally decide at that point mm. exactly how many minor arcs you can fit in to your major arc um, I like this. I want to. I want to share this real quick. Uh, Sean Dugan says, "I still wish I'd give with my original plan with uh, my group and had one of the segments having them stuck in an episode of Freedom Friends, complete with opera and animation." Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would imagine that GMs regret most of the things they don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, not everything. No, but <laughs> what, like any creative endeavor, game mastering is one of those things where, you know, like two weeks later, you'll be like, oh, I just thought of the perfect thing that I could have done in that adventure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. I also like this. This is a very interesting uh, um, idea. Uh, Claude says, I want to see community members remix and share their own versions of the Associated Adventures combos. I say, yeah, absolutely. More than welcome. Uh, we'd even be happy to kind of talk about them and highlight them. And, um, talk about how awesome they are. Um, yeah. Well, so listen, friends, we are um, nearly out of time. And um, I believe we started on time today, didn't we? Yeah, reasonably. We did. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to say real quick, um, hey, Steve, what do you got cooking? Um, what's going on in Steve Kensonland, which is a theme uh, park you can go to? Right now, I am working on mostly Valiant Adventures stuff. Um, I'm working on a supplementary thing to the Heroes uh, Handbook and digging into my uh, setting stuff. Uh, there's lots of research and note taking and organization and whatnot to talk about all of the aspects of the, the Valiant universe uh, and the like. So it's it's been primarily uh, working on that right now. Oh, and I just uh, did some stuff for getting the um, uh, Arcane Secrets duology uh, off Ooh, yeah. print. So. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, you know, this, let's see. <laughs> uh, Apu shares, since we're talking about Astonishing Adventures Assembled, mm -hmm. we are re-releasing all of the contained adventures on Roll20 with a big glow up, including yes. new art, new tokens, new maps, and more. It's exciting. That is very, very exciting. Wait, what? Ay, 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 so sorry. I don't know why Alex pushed that button. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so a um, question then uh, for you, Alex, what have you got cooking in your world? What's happening? What, what's new? What's now? What's wow? Oh, lots of things. Um, I have, I'm waiting for my Gen Con events to get approved so that people can sign up for them. We'll be sure mm -hmm. to tell you exactly as soon as we know when they're available for signups so that you can come and play with me. I'd love to see all of you. Um, tomorrow night, we are doing jo the Joy of Game Mastering with Alex Thomas um, at 7 p.m. That's right. We're going to be talking about convention games, uh, specifically how to write uh, one shots, how to cast the characters. And I got a couple of questions on the last Joy of Game Mastering video that I'm going to be covering uh, regarding our rank chart for Eminem. And uh, there was something else that uh, somebody asked me about, which I'm going to go back and double check. Um, and then Wednesday, I'll be back. Uh, Wednesday, I'll be back for Freedom Be Dark and the Multiverse of the Master Mage at 7 p.m. And Friday, I'll have whatever's going to happen to Gamma Smasher in Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Right. Um, you know, uh, Joe, I want to end on this just because it's such a great comment. But the idea that you may think that something's kind of corny. Uh, he says, I had a game of Eminem where I was the new GM and I had a scene where an unusual call box made a sound to draw the players mm -hmm. who didn't know each other into the scene. Once they arrived, the call box disappeared. I thought it was cheesy, a uh, cheesy way to bring pieces together, but they really enjoyed it. And that's, that's really fun. what you're out for, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, yeah. So let me think if there are any other news items. Jim Jonesy says, uh, I'm adding some Gen Con events as well, but I also want to say, are you going to be a Gen Con? You, the listener, you, the watcher. Yeah. You the participant, yeah. If you are going to be wearing your participants, um, fill out this form that's slowly making its way to you. Uh, there you go. Um, uh, fill it out, and um, you know maybe you are an enthusiast journalist. You are enthusiastic about our games. We want to sit down and, and set up an interview. Um, maybe maybe you're interested in hanging out for a closed door session about the adventure. What is it called? The advent <laughs> the adventure game engine, or A, as it's known mm -hmm. for decades now. Um, yes. But no, wow. we, yeah, no, we're going to have some discussions. We're going to share some insights. And um, if you are somebody who did not get an opportunity to sign up on our um, on our meeting that we're going to be having before, like maybe maybe the end of this week, maybe there are people even in the audience who have received the invite. Um, I know this is all age stuff, but I just want to get it out there because you're invited to fill out that form, but mm -hmm. do it soon mm -hmm. because I'll only add a couple more people. We get a full house, friends. Uh, and just, of course, they join us for yeah. Thursday. Age. That's right. And that's where, you know, again, we're going to keep up the hard hitting news, the exposés. <laughs> we're going to keep up this energy for the rest of the year. Uh, I couldn't do it for the rest. Could you imagine just being that obnoxious? I mean, I'm obnoxious in my own special way, but that obnoxious? I mean, come on. Mm. I'm a lazy obnoxious. Troy, we're rooming at Gen Con. Please don't do that. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'll just carry around that. Dun, 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 ding, dun, dun, dun. Right. Just take a week <laughs> off. <laughs> Everywhere in person. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I do want to say Gen Con is going to be interesting. Yeah, um, uh, I'm rooming with you, Alex. Uh, we'll also have a, 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 a guest with us as well, staying in the room. And um, I heard, you know, I'm not, I don't really do all that weird sort of uh, gravy squatch sightings stuff, but there is word that gravy squatch will be at Gen Con. Um, really? They, Stay away. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> oh, ew, you go to your bed. Um, but. With that being said, um, hey friends, it's the end of the program, which means we get to leave. Um, hey, Alex, Steve, thanks for hanging out with everybody. Um, truly Pleasure appreciate always. another wonderful episode. I want to thank everybody in chat. We're all very cool, very awesome. And uh, you know you know what I say? And thank you very much. Just thanks, Steve, Alex, and Troy. A great memo. And with that, I say bye-bye. Bye, everybody.